Hi, everybody. Good evening, and welcome to the very first episode of Late Nights in Bed with Oshi Reads. <laughs> Hi, my name is Oshale. If this is your very first time watching me, welcome to my channel and welcome to my new late night episodic series where I talk about whatever I want. And it doesn't have to be book related. Sorry for this camera angle. Just gonna have to get used to it because we are literally in bed with me, <laughs> as the title suggests. So tonight we are going to be talking about dun -dun -dun -dun, cancel culture. Yes, we are going to be talking about cancel culture, y'all, because authors have been behaving very, very badly out on these streets. And a lot of my other fellow booktubers and book bloggers have already talked about it. And now it's it's my turn. It's my turn to talk about it. And, you know, it's been very interesting because I've had so many thoughts going through my mind. On one hand, I'm not shocked and I'm not surprised by the things that I've seen, by the things that I've heard. But on the other hand, I continue to be disappointed, right? Because when you're a reader and when you really read a book that touches you, that moves you, that becomes one of your favorite books, you also then sort of have this idea that the person who wrote the book is a good person. Oh, Oh, how flawed that idea is because more than likely they are just a human being, just like you, just like me, just like everyone else. It does not guarantee the content of their character is very high. It does not guarantee that they do not have problematic ideologies, that they do not hold very prejudiced beliefs and have belief systems that are antiquated and outdated. It does not mean that they won't mess up, that they won't say things that are really hurtful, that they won't do things that are troublesome. You know, they're just human beings. And yet, where do we draw the line, right? Where do we kind of say we're going to separate the author from their work? And then where do we also say we're going to hold them accountable to the things that they're saying and doing that are harmful to a community, various communities, to people, um, more than likely, people who have read it enjoyed their books. So that brings me to this video. Now, I made a video about cancel culture years ago. Years ago. Um, why did I say that? At least a year ago now. And it's been a while since I've watched that video. In fact, I don't think I've watched it since I posted it. And when this whole discussion came back up again of, you know, holding authors accountable to the things that they say, to their beliefs, you know, listening to their apologies, but really dissecting and seeing which ones are performative, which ones seem genuine. Cancel culture came back up and this video gained traction again with people. And more recently, I received an Instagram DM from somebody who had recently seen the video and found my channel and really poured out their hearts to me in the Instagram DM messages and shared, you know, their thoughts on the video. So I thought, why don't we rewatch it together? Because honestly, I haven't seen it since then. I don't know if my thoughts have changed because I don't remember what I said in that video. And I feel like I may have different views now on some of the things that I said. So I just thought it would be interesting for us to revisit that video. Let's see. I'm going to try to share the screen. Oh, my old intro. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel, Oshalay here, and in today's video, I kind of wanted to talk about and explore cancel culture in the booktube community and in the book community in general. I think that this is a very interesting topic to tackle, only because now in 2019, more than ever, we have seen the surge and kind of takeover of cancel culture. and. Cancel culture is something that seems to, on one hand, only exist online and in, on this, in the sphere of this online community, whether it be through social media apps such as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, but doesn't necessarily always translate into the real world and doesn't always kind of cross that gap and make it into, you know, 
our reality outside of the online world. But on the other hand, it can also be quite damaging and very detrimental to certain individuals, to their careers, to their image, to their finances, and to their brand. And therefore, that's when it does kind of cross that bridge and make it over to the real world. And so I still think, I think this is really interesting because I still believe this. Um, I think that cancel culture doesn't always make its way into the real world. Oftentimes it can be something that is staunchly rooted in the online world and someone can literally just log out of their account for several weeks and, you know, that cancel culture mob situation will then die down and then they can just come back several months later with an apology saying that they've changed and they've grown and then continue. And, you know, obviously sometimes that may, this may be genuine, maybe the backlash really helped them to change their ways and reconsider how they were acting and really just, you know, become better people. And then other times it's obviously not very genuine. It's very performative. And they just knew that all they had to do was log off, leave, and come back several months later with a very, you know, weak apology and they would be able to get their fan base back. So. Cause irreparable damage to people's careers and livelihoods. So I just thought it'd be interesting to discuss it when it comes to things like our community, our bookish community here on BookTube, online, and also when it comes to interacting with our favorite authors through various social media apps. But I'm going to specifically be talking about Twitter here because Twitter seems to have caused a lot of mishaps and mini scandals with some very recognizable authors. So yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about today. I do want to say before we begin that I'm not a proponent or a fan of cancel culture. So I just wanted to get that out of the way to be completely open and honest with you all. So this video will be as unbiased as I can. So I will just say right now that I still hold to this belief. I am still not a proponent or a fan of cancel culture. Um, I do not believe that it is as effective as it could be. I think that the media machine is very relentless and there's always a new scandal to distract people. I think people have very short attention spans. I think that people enjoy bandwagoning and jump, jumping on bandwagons for the moment. I think people enjoy being outraged. I think the mob mentality is very strong and it doesn't always, well, I should say it doesn't usually cause a lasting change. I think that all cancel culture really truly does is either causes the person who is in question to be canceled to double down on their beliefs. And honestly, I almost have more respect for people when they say, I said what I said, you know, even if I find their beliefs to be in direct opposition to my beliefs. But it either causes the person to double down even stronger or it causes them, you know, once enough backlash has, you know, been garnered to now come with this apology that seems very insincere because they were completely unapologetic until things got too hot, you know, it got a little too hot in the kitchen. And now all of a sudden, they're like that meme of the dog and the house on fire all around it going, it's fine, when it's really not fine. And it's clearly not fine. But they're trying to make us feel like it's fine because they're apologizing. But it's not fine because it's not a real apology. Get what I'm saying? See? So yeah, let us continue. Make it, but I am on a side and it is on the side of not being a fan of cancel culture. Now, here on YouTube, we have kind of seen cancel culture detrimentally affect certain creators, not necessarily on BookTube, although we can discuss that as well, but more recently we have seen, you know, with the James Charles and the Tati West books, Brooks scandal in the beauty community, a lot of beauty. Oh, the James Charles and the Tati Westbrook scandal. 
This is back when things were oh so simple. And if you're familiar with the beauty community at all on YouTube, then you know how much this freaking spiraled into a saga <laughs> to the point where I actually privated my original James Charles Tati Westbrook video because it was so off base at that point. Because once new revelations fully came to light, I could not keep that video up. But I digress. Community scandals, uh, you know, Jeffree Star and, you know, now more recently, Jaclyn Hill with her Jaclyn Hill cosmetics, huge scandal that just keeps to, keeps to be, just seems to keep growing bigger and bigger and more and more as the weeks go on. I will say this, though. Uh, this almost proves my point from what I was saying earlier, because Jaclyn Hill is fine. <laughs> She's fine. You know, she still gets millions of views on her videos. She still has supporters. She still has people that love her. She still has people that are buying her things. Um, Jeffree Star is fine. He's fine. Um, I will say that James Charles is not so fine, so fine as of this week. They, YouTube demonetized his entire channel. But that's because of the allegations that we will not discuss because I don't want this video to get demonetized. But the SA assault, S assault allegations um, that have been coming out about him, I'm not going to go much more into that. But yeah. And, you know, the latest news for those that care <laughs> is that she has actually now deactivated all of her social media. So she is at the point now where her scandal has crossed over into the real world and it is now detrimentally affecting her brand and her actual life, you know, just not monetarily, but just her mental health. And that's why she deacted all of her social media. She's no longer on Instagram or Twitter. You cannot find her. And last we heard, she is in a very bad way in terms of her mental health. And she felt that she needed to leave social media to protect her mental health. So that's just one example I can give. Now that Okay, now I will say that, again, you know, I understand that the backlash that she was getting was so heated and so in extreme and so intense that it affected her mental health to the point where she needed to log off. But take it from someone who often takes social media breaks and not due to scandals or being on the chopping block to being canceled, just to detox and because I honestly deep, deep, deep down, actually don't really like social media that much. Um, once you log off, and even if you were to go as far as to delete the apps from your phone, what consequences are you really facing? Uh, for her, okay, so people were no longer purchasing her palette, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But people are buying her stuff now. You know, her scandal's old news now. She's completely bounced back. That is not an example that is relevant to booktube and to the book community, but I just wanted to give an example so that we can all kind of understand here the basis of what I will be, you know, going into in this video. So, more into my views on cancel culture. Like I stated earlier, I am not a fan of cancel culture whatsoever. I actually feel that cancel culture is detrimental to us as a society. I do feel that it can feel very, you know, it can feel very energizing and empowering to participate in cancel culture, right? Because, you know, all these social, social justice warriors online seem to get this kind of, <laughs> I almost want to call it a sick pleasure out of canceling people, you know, out of either unearthing, you know, that, you know, racist tweets, misogynistic, homophobic, every obic ick you can think of, tweet in someone's past, someone who is prominent at the moment, you know, someone who is currently hot, you know, like a Cardi B, or, you know, more recently, Chris Brown, you know, when we're talking about, again, people outside of the book community, we, I'm, when it comes to the book community, I am not going to be mentioning any specific... Okay, so essentially what I'm trying to say here is that um, cancel, cancel culture doesn't help us as a people in the long run. And I think I still 
nothing. I know I still feel the same way. I still hold these views. I think it's more detrimental than it is helpful because it, it really builds in us versus them mentality. And it builds this environment where, you know, you're evil or you're good. Everything's very black and white. And people are not allowed to grow. People are not allowed to change. People are not allowed to be forgiven. People are not allowed to be shown grace. And if you are taking the side of someone who wants to forgive, who wants to give someone a second or third chance, who wants to show grace, you are seen as weak. You are seen as being someone who is um, enabling the behavior, you are seen as someone who is naive and, you know, on the wrong side of history, on the wrong moral side, all of these things. And it's really disturbing because we can no longer have these nuanced discussions and conversations about disagreements, whether they be moralistic disagreements or disagreements about bigger things like race and, you know, politics and values and morals and how we see the world and different prejudices that we may hold. We can no longer come to the pro proverbial table and have these discussions because you're canceled, right? The person is canceled. We're not supposed to be talking to them. We're supposed to hate them. We're supposed to completely cancel them, right? We cancel out all anything that they've done, all of the, don't buy their things, don't support them, don't go see their films. Don't, 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 don't. How long? Forever. <laughs> you know? So where do you draw the line, right? It gets very, very dicey. And for me, I just don't see how this is beneficial in the long run. I don't see how this helps us as humanity able to come to the table and talk things out, hash things out. I, I see it causing more divisions, more animosity more fear. Um, it creates these mobs. It's like a witch hunt. It just gets very crazy. And I think that that's when we have to start talking about accountability because people always want to say, oh, well, we're holding people accountable. And I think that accountability is important, but I think that the discussion is not nuanced enough. It's very black and white. It's either you cancel them and by canceling them, you're holding them accountable or, oh my gosh, you're going to forgive them? That that that's not holding them accountable. Well, I mean, you can hold someone accountable to their actions and forgive them as well, <laughs> you know? And, you know, of course we have to talk about, you know, perception versus reality versus facts versus logic. We have to go into these individual situations to see who's genuinely sorry, who's being performative. Of course we can have all those discussions as we should. But I think that with cancel culture being so overwhelmingly like harsh, it creates a space where you can't even have these kind of discussions. And I think that is detrimental to the advancement of our society. Pick authors, uh, any specific names, because I don't want to put that negativity out there and I don't want to promote that because I'm a firm believer that when someone shows you who they are, you need to believe them. That doesn't mean that you need to, you know, go after them and drag them and destroy their whole lives and destroy their career and all that. Like, that's where I draw the line, which is why I'm not a fan of cancel culture. I also believe that people can grow, people can change, and we need to, we need to be able to give people a second chance. Now, third, fourth, fifth, eighth chance, no. But when we see genuine change, genuine improvement, people actually evolving, because that's what life is about. Life is a journey. It's about evolution. It's about growth. It's about learning. It's about, you know, becoming a better you. And cancel culture to me is the literal antithesis of our journey here on earth as human beings. It is. So yeah, basically what I just said, I think two things can be true simultaneously, right? I think that's part of the nuance that I was mentioning before. I think it's possible to believe someone when they show you who they are. And it's also possible for you to acknowledge that they are on a growth journey, just as you are on a growth journey. And this person that they are today may not be the person they are tomorrow, in a week, in a month, in a year. Now, do they need to, 
do they need to put in the work? You know, I freaking hate that phrase now. Thank you for ruining for me, Bachelor. But um, do they need to put in the work? Well, just also just ugh, put in the work. It's just so triggering now. Um, yes, of course they need to put in the work and we need to see that work and we need to see that change. We need to see that growth, of course. But, you know, we need to also give them a chance to grow, to change. And especially when it comes to digging up people's past from 10, 20, 30 years ago. I mean, come on, especially when it's clear that they've changed, they've grown, they're different now. And it sucks. You know, a lot of things, you know, the internet isn't, you know, that old, but a lot of things, you know, if it's online, it's forever. And people's old tweets are used against them. Now, if they're clearly the same character as they were when they made those original tweets, absolutely, you know, not good. Discussion needs to be had. If you see that they are not the same person, a discussion needs to be had. But it seems like across the board, the conclusion of this discussion is cancel them forever, which I just don't think is... <laughs> What good does that do? Literally against everything that we were put here to do. And I think it's very dangerous that we have kind of started this, um, this internet witch hunt, this viral 3D witch hunt of people in a way. And we are now so happy and delighted to cancel people permanently. And we take so much joy out of dragging people and you know putting all of their dirty laundry out there and really just denigrating them to the point where you know we hope that they can't even recover from it now are all people who commit these sins that we are asking for okay now before i go into this next point <sighs> I think there's a difference between having a critical discussion about things that people has, have done that have hurt people, that have hurt communities, especially with everything that's gone on this past year, with just everything that's gone on with the Black Lives Matter movement, all of the protests, the recent uh, verdict of Derek Chauvin. It's a lot. And I think that cancel culture almost took on a new identity, a new dimension where it really freed people to be able to speak their truth when it comes to racial disparity, when it comes to racism and the racism that they've faced and they've experienced, when it comes to speaking up on their truth and standing up for, you know, justice and being able to say, this is not okay. And I'm, I'm tired of this. And white society, please do better. Please educate yourselves. Please see what's going on. I think cancel culture did take on a, a new face almost where it was propelling things forward in a positive direction. But in a weird way, I think we stalled. We're, we're stalled right now in this place where everything is online and everything is very performative right now. And we have people who are actually real life activists that are fighting for laws to be changed and are fighting to elect certain officials and are fighting for people's voices who need to be heard to be heard and for the right people to have the right microphones in front of them and to stand on the highest platforms possible so that we can actually change the world for the better. Um, that's not to be confused with your social media activist who just shares memes <laughs> and reposts things that they haven't even looked into seeing if there's journalistic integrity behind what they're reposting. And I'm guilty of this as well, which is why I've stopped really reposting things as much if I don't have time to look into it. I fell down the rabbit hole too. I fell into the trap too, you know? And yeah, let's go into it this next part. For them to be canceled I'm going to take it back a little bit. And really just denigrating them to the point where, you know, we hope that they can't even recover from it. Now, are all people who commit these sins that we are asking for them to be canceled for, are all of the, these people equal in their, in their malfractions and, you know, the bad things that they've done? No, they're not. There's certainly things that are worse than others, in my opinion. And, you know, there are certain actions and things that have been done that can be seen as unforgivable. 
And I can't speak for anyone's community that has been affected. You know, if someone says a homophobic tweet, I cannot speak for the LGBTQ plus community because I'm not a part of that community. I'm an ally, but I'm not a part of it. So who am I to say that that community needs to accept that person's apology who spoke out against them or, you know, hurt them or said some truly hurt things, whether it be on a tweet, on Instagram, on Facebook, in an interview, um, online, on, in any forum, you know, even in a magazine, or is even actively doing things in their lives and crusading against the LGBTQ plus community, who am I to say that they, they should now accept that person's apology if that person apologizes? And I still wholeheartedly believe this because I know how frustrated I felt as a black person where non-black people have tried to tell me how I should feel or how I should respond about something or how I should act. And it's been very frustrating, you know? I'm not your Negro, you know, James Baldwin. Um, yeah, it's very frustrating when you're, you're up against that. So I fully, fully, fully still stand on this. If I'm not a part of the community that's been affected by whatever this author has said or done, I'm not going to speak for that community. I'm going to stand in allyship. Um, I'm going to be completely honest and transparent here. One of the things that has been particularly hard has been two authors in, in particular, J.K. Rowling and Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. And I'm naming names in this video because I think we've moved we've moved past. Mm, mm, We've moved past that place where we hold our tongues because negativity. And I know I said that earlier in my last video, and this is where I've I've really changed and I've really differed. Differed? I don't I'm not even using that word right. Where I've really just diverted from that way of thinking is you gotta call out the thing, you know? You can't just point at it and say the thing. Name the thing and talk about the thing. So we're talking about the thing. I was actually having a really, really intense conversation with my friend, Rachel. Shout out to you, Rachel, uh, about this. She's one of my oldest friends. We went to college together and she currently lives in London, the UK. And one of the things that we bonded over forever is our love of Harry Potter. And I absolutely adore and loved Harry Potter growing up. It was a huge part of my childhood and Rachel loves it even more than than I do. She's a super fan. She actually met her husband because of Harry Potter. A lot of the friends that she made in the UK is because of Harry Potter. I mean, it just was this whole world. She went to the conventions. Like it was like this whole thing, right? It was so much bigger than the books and the films for her. And so we were having this conversation recently during one of our WhatsApp chats about this very topic and how much J.K. Rowling has really, really hurt the trans community with her beliefs and how hard it is for those of us who are not trans, but who count ourselves as trans allies to be able to let go of something that was such a huge part of our lives. And, you know, obviously don't make Harry Potter and your freaking wizarding house a part of your identity to the point where it's literally hurting people and you can't let it go. That's problematic. But also we were talking about this whole idea behind censorship, right? And and what you support publicly versus what you do privately. And, you know, by no means do we want to censor people and say, hey, don't read this and don't read that because that's a very slippery slope. It's giving me Fahrenheit 451 vibes. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you missed out on a great classic. I um, actually really liked Fahrenheit 451 when I was reading it in English class. Not everyone felt the same way. Oh, well, I liked it. But it's giving me very for Fahrenheit 451 vibes. It's giving me burn all the books that we don't like vibes. I don't like it, right? So we were discussing this and I'm like, you know what? It's all about what you support publicly. It's all about what you're pushing, you know, as a book reviewer, as a content reviewer, as someone who has a platform, I'm never going to publicly support something that's hurt people because that's wrong. You know, no amount of love of a fandom or a world or a set of books outweighs people's lives. <laughs> Plain and simple. Okay. 
Um, and then another author I brought up is Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, and I've always admired her. I love all of her books. And her recent comments, again, about the trans community, about women, and who gets to identify as a woman and who doesn't. And um, even her recent interaction with, um, was it Amezi? She wrote Freshwater, and I can, I, I don't want to butcher her name. Amezi quick quick. And a quickie. Uh, I'm going to pull her up real quick because I don't like mispronouncing people's names. <clears throat> Let's see here. But her recent comments about this author who is a non-binary trans author, Amezi Akweke. Amezi Akweke. Very troubling. Very, very troubling and very shocking for someone who says she's a feminist and who believes in equal rights and all these things, right? I still haven't been able to wrap my brain around it, to be honest with you. And it affected me to the point where I was asked to be a part of something called the Afrocentric April Books Tour on books Bookstagram, where for a whole entire month, for the whole entire month of April, we've been uplifting African authors. And every single day there's a different prompt and we promote different books and different authors. And it got to the point where for one of the days, I signed up to talk about books by uh, my favorite debut by an African author. And I had Purple Hibiscus by Chimamanda as the book that I was going to talk about and that I was going to post about. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. I can't post about this. Not after what she said. Not after how much she's hurt the trans community, not after how much she's hurt the non-binary community. I, I can't support this publicly. I can't post about this book and say, hey, and completely ignore the things that she said without having that conversation. And we're supposed to be spotlighting African authors. And I don't want to have to step back, have that conversation, and then like feel awkward about promoting her book as much as I loved Purple Hibiscus. So I changed it. I posted another book you know, book by an, an another another debut book that I love by an African author who hasn't said anything problematic, <laughs> at least as far as I know. Sorry, my computer virus protection, you know how it goes. So I say all that to say, it's very, very important to face these things and to recognize that there are consequences. And sometimes the cons consequences touch our own lives, right? And it's, it goes so much further than the authors themselves and the things that they've said. They touch our own lives and we now have consequences and we now have to be hold ourselves accountable to what we say we believe and who we say we are. And so I'm not going to speak for anyone's community who is affected or who have been affected by, you know, certain people engaging in hate speech or hateful actions. So that's, that's my number one thing. You can't speak for anyone. You can only speak for yourself. And if you've been affected personally, then it's up to you to kind of decide how you're going to handle that. Are you going to forgive that person? Or if you are a believer in cancel culture, are you going to cancel them? Now, let's talk about the different types of ways that people cancel people, right? And then we'll move more into the, the bookish side of things. So when it comes to cancel culture, there are sort of boundaries in my mind. So even though I say I'm not a fan of cancel culture, I also do believe in non-support. And I honestly feel that non-support is kind of a healthier, more effective version of cancel culture, because you'll find that a lot of people who participate in cancel culture, it's a lot of talk and no action, right? You see a lot of these kind of like really entertaining tweets dragging people and you know exposing people that we all love to take a part of well not all i shouldn't say all but a lot of us love to take a part of love to just kind of sit there and watch and sip our tea because we're messy and we love the drama and so you have those people but but when those people log off of their devices when they get off their phones when they're not on twitter anymore when they're not on instagram anymore when they have decided to close their computer and they're not on facebook and they're not in the comment sections of these you know magazines and you know online sites 
they go on to quietly support these people behind the scenes. You'll have someone dragging Jeffree Star for his latest scandal, but then go buy his palette or watch his videos or click on his videos when they're recommended to them on YouTube. You know, you'll have people speak out against certain politicians, but then they won't go vote. You see what I'm saying? It's, it lives only online. And, you know, not only does it live only online, it is the most toxic version of itself. It's where you're, you're you know, abusing people dragging them, you know, sending messages. Sorry, there's like fuzzies in my lip gloss. Sending messages like, you know, why don't you go kill yourself or I hope you jump off a bridge or I hate you or you suck, delete all your social media, you know, attacking their brand, you know, making it so that individual. So it's so interesting to watch this video back and see how much I still agree with so much of what I was saying, which is interesting but how for me, the topic has grown so much more nuanced. And when I talk about non-support, I now realize how personal non-support is because it's true. We talked about the 24 hour news cycle earlier and how there's always a new scandal and there's always something new to focus on. And people's attention spans are so short and the outrage, it burns so hot, but it burns out so quickly. And then people are on to the next. And the non-support part for me, I've just realized how personal it is because that's where personal responsibility comes in, personal accountability comes in, where you now have to put your money where your mouth is, so to speak. And you have to prove with your actions that your words are true. And, you know, we can't see that, you know, we can't see the non-support. You know, I can see your tweets. I can see your Instagram captions. I can see your TikTok book talk video condemning someone or what someone has said or done, but I can't see you not buying their books anymore. I can't see you uh, choosing not to buy their merch. I can't see you, you know, choosing to not to accept books from publishers who continue to support people who are racist and who, who, you know, continue to say racist and really horrific things. I can't see that, right? I can't see you turning down opportunities to work with people who have hurt certain, you know, marginalized communities. I can't see that. I can only see what you put online. So that's where the place where non-support I've realized now is very personal and it is very much like, where do you draw the line? Because again, I don't believe in censorship and I don't believe in banning people from reading books, certain books. I just don't. Um, but I do believe in putting your money where your mouth is. And if you say that you don't support something, then you have to actively not support it. You know, you have to actively not support it in whatever ways that works for you and whatever that looks like or a company can no longer go online because of all of the hate, the hate, all the comments, uh, you know, people's mental health starts to be in danger because you have people sending you messages that they hate you, to go kill yourself, to go jump off a bridge, all this crazy stuff, right? Toxic. But a lot of people who participate on that side of cancel culture, again, are only participating online. And a lot of times in their real lives, they're not taking action, right? And action is more powerful than words in in my opinion, in this sort of thing. So they're saying all these hurtful things, hateful, horrible things, you know, participating in the negativity, the toxicity online, but then once they log off, they're doing something completely different behind closed doors and in real in the real world. So that's why I talk about the healthier version of cancel culture, which is non-support. And non-support simply means if someone, whether it be a celebrity, a public figure, an influencer, a creator, a YouTuber, an author says something or does something that does not agree with you, whether it goes against your values, your morals, your ethics, you just feel like it's wrong, stop supporting them. And you stop supporting them with your dollar. I might have to speed this video up because things are getting a little bit long here. Supporting that person with your money, that is actually going to make an effect that's big enough that is going to cause a reaction in that other person that is noticeable enough that will cause them to, to turn away from their current actions to change because it's hitting their pockets. And they're gonna realize, oh, 
you know, nobody's buying my stuff anymore. No one's going to my friends anymore. I'm not being supported. My fans are dwindling. I need to change. I need to wake up. Sorry. I something different. Now, whether that change is genuine or not, that's a whole nother story. Sorry, y'all. I'm up here with two dogs rolling around, bumping into my computer. The struggle is real. <sighs> discussion and that's something that you have to decide for yourself but that is actually something that's actively going to make a difference as opposed to just this cancel culture online where there's nothing actively being done and you know when the next scandal breaks that person kind of off the hook and it's like onto the next story and things kind of blow over and they were going to continue to do what they were doing anyway and people are just going to sweep it under the rug so now when it comes to book cheap with cancel culture i have seen this a lot on book twitter you guys book twitter is a trap I am not on book Twitter. Uh, when I become a published author, I will not be on book Twitter. Sorry, y'all. You guys are going to have to connect with me another way. But a lot of authors are kind of exposing themselves on book Twitter by their retweets, their tweets, the things that they're supporting, the things that they're saying. Like, I still wholeheartedly believe this. I don't understand why authors are so active on social media. On one hand, as a reader, it's great to be able to have an opportunity to interact with my favorite authors and have them possibly talk to me in the comments or retweet or repost things that I post about their books. But on the other hand, it's, to me, the cons outweigh the pros and the risks outweigh the rewards, plain and simple, plain and simple. Still feel this way. It's so unfortunate. <laughs> and I'm the kind of person where I believe in separating the artist from the art. I'm a very strong believer in that. Otherwise, I would never want to read like Alice in Wonderland. I would never support, you know, a lot of authors that I have a lot of um, respect for. And I, I mean respect because I respect their writing. I respect their craft. I respect the books that they put out. You know, a lot of these classic authors that I really like their work, I would never read their work because of the person behind the work. So I'm a very firm believer in separating the art from the artist, if you can. Now, sometimes, the, the artist and the character of the artist is so, like their actions and the character are, is so overwhelmingly against you and against your soul and who you are that you cannot separate them and you can't ignore it. Understand. I also think it's hard to ignore it when you notice that certain like belief systems that authors have has bled so heavily into their work that it's so clear and you can see the problematic elements that has bled into their writing and it no longer makes it a pleasant reading experience for you because you understand where those ideologies are coming from and it's not just fiction and it's not just a character arc it's actually how the author feels and that can get very uncomfortable very quick but for the most part i am a believer in separating the two so i say all that to say book twitter is a trap and a lot of authors on book twitter are really digging themselves into a hole that they're going to be really struggling to get out of when it comes time to get people to buy their books i know a lot of authors you know, across all genres now that have been canceled by readers because of things that they said, the things they've retweeted, things that they've liked, uh, just mess, you guys, just mess. And because of their actions online, they've now been canceled and they've lost, you know, a lot of, you know, loyal readers, loyal fans, and even potential new readers because of their actions. And these new readers are like, oh, I saw that tweet. I saw that like, I saw that dislike. I saw that retweet. I saw that photo on Instagram. I saw that blog post or that, you know, blog piece. I am not going to be supporting this author. I'm not going to be buying their next book. This is so me. Like, there's so many new authors that I just won't be reading their books because of the things that they said on Twitter. Like, ever. Like, I just lost complete interest in ever caring about them or their work. Book, you know, I was curious about this book. Now I'm not going to buy it. So, <laughs> when it comes to cancel culture in the bookish community, I do feel that we are very quick to cancel these authors. Like, we waste no time. We're like, oh. Oh, what they said, what they liked, what they tweeted, what, oh, they're canceled, I'm not buying their books. You know, we go on these huge campaigns to cancel these people, and I just think that it might be a bit premature. I think we need to start to actively practice trying to separate the artist and the art a little bit more. Um, also, I feel like authors, y'all need to get off of Twitter if you can't stop getting yourself in trouble and stop getting yourself into these scandals. What happened to just being on social media to promote your books and just being chill and low-key? Instead, things get very, very personal and not in a good way. I understand why to connect with your fans, but some of the things that some of these authors are doing online is just like, ay, 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 you gotta have a divide, okay? You need to keep your personal life behind the scenes and understand that you are you know, a recognizable name now and whatever you do, people are going to connect that to your work. You know? I still wholly believe this. I think that this may be a bit, con well, it's not controversial, but I think that it may be a little bit stifling, some people may think, or restrictive, but, you are a brand. Once you become a published author, whether you be self-published, independently published, 
published by a big um, publisher, whatever, published, okay, published, people are reading your work. You have to understand that you're now a public figure, okay? No matter what you say or do, I'm starting to talk like the warp speed. <laughs> no matter what you say or do, it's going to be attributed to your work. It is, it is. And I still believe in separating the work from the artist. I just, as an artist myself and someone who's like actually trained in acting and things like that, that's just how I've always been trained to separate the two. And there would just be a lot of things that I wouldn't be able to enjoy if I wasn't able to separate the two. That's just life. And like I said, it's different for everybody where you draw the line and what you're able to accept and what you're able to separate and all that. That's personal. But I don't understand why these authors don't see that once you publish your work and you have people reading your books, you are now a public figure, period, period. Unless you have a Finsta account, like a fake Instagram, or you're going under a different name, or you're private, I just, and even when you're private, people are all about exposing people. No, I, like I said, I believe in separating art from artists. Most people don't, and most people don't have to. And people like to support and buy things from people that they like. So when you oh. become unlikable, it takes a permanent hit on your career and on your brand. And sometimes it's really hard to come back from that, you know, especially in the publishing. Publishing is a very hard industry. And if you make missteps, especially in the beginning of your career, it can have detrimental effects that can be very, very hard to recover from. So this is almost like a warning video for all writers out there. Just be very careful what you're tweeting, what you're what you're doing online. You know, cancel culture is very real out here. And, you know, you guys are ruthless online. Like, you guys are really vicious. So, I once again, I believe in non-support. And I believe in giving people second chances within reason. But this cancel culture thing has really just gotten out of hand. But anyways, that's all I wanted to say in this video. You guys let me know how you feel and what you think down below. Again, please try not to name any names out of disrespect. I don't want to start this like fuel and feud and fire online where we're name dropping and we're scandal dropping. Let's not do that. Uh, just respectfully comment down below in generalizations and let me know your thoughts. And I Okay, so that was basically the gist of the video. We are now done with the video. So yeah, oh my gosh, we're an hour in. Late nights and bad weather with Shayra is okay. <laughs> But um, yeah, it's interesting because I, I, like I said, I hadn't watched that video really since I posted it and I still hold a lot of the same views and I still feel the same way and cancel culture really has gotten out of hand and it's like a runaway freight train at this point and I don't know if we're going to be able to catch it or stop it. And I just, I just am not a proponent for things where people aren't allowed to be people and evolve. It just doesn't seem human it doesn't seem human it seems like we're all looking for a sacrifice it reminds me of old school roman empire where they had the gladiators fight to the death in the Colosseum, and they had the people the poor people that were eaten by lions it's that kind of spectacle right obviously it's not exactly the same because the people that were being fed to lions and things of that nature, a lot of them were petty criminals, but a lot of them were also just oppressed peoples that were at the wrong place at the wrong time. And unfortunately, now they're lion food. Um, we're not going to go into ancient Rome, but you know, you, you, take, you get what I'm saying. It's not a perfect analogy, but it feels like that. It feels very Salem witch trials, even though that's also not perfect analogy, because I understand a lot of innocent people were falsely accused of witchcraft and we're actually trying to hold people who have done things that are not great to downright hurtful, harmful things. We're trying to hold them accountable and we're trying to hold their feet to the fire. And we're trying to get them to understand that it's not okay and that we're not going to tolerate it. That part I agree with, but I don't like how far it goes. I don't like how personal it gets. It's almost like you become as bar bad as the, as the thing that you're speaking out against, right? It's like when the but people speaking out against bullying become the bullies. It's a very fine line. It's a very slippery slope. And where do you draw the line? I was having, again, shout out to my friend, Rachel. In our conversation that we were having, we, we brought up so many great points because, you know, we were talking about, like, where do you draw the line? Because for her, she's just not no longer going to support JK Rowling with her dollars. She's not going to, you know go to the theme parks or participate in anything where she's going to get a direct cut 
into her pockets. But that doesn't mean she's not going to read the books. That doesn't mean she's not going to introduce her children to them. But she's going to be able to have a nuanced discussion with her future kids because, you know, you have to be able to dissect J.K. Rowling's work and see if any of her harmful ideologies have bled into her writing. And then you have to talk, have a discussion about that. And, you know, I use J.K. Rowling so heavily in this video because that's what's fresh in my mind and that's, you know, who I was recently discussing with a friend of mine this very topic. But I think it goes across the board for any author that has said something or done something harmful is where do you draw the line? Is it that you're no longer going to buy their future books? Are you going to give away the books on your shelves that they have? Are you going to stop reading their books? Are you going to continue to read their books but not publicly support their books or talk about their books? Are you going to hold space for them to come back and apologize if they've apologized already? Are you going to try to see how genuine it is and see if they change? There's so many things that, that go into it and it's not going to be the same for every person, right? And that's where the work comes in on our end and the personal accountability of holding yourself to your own standards and holding yourself to your own morals and what you say you believe. And I think most recently about um, Emily Duncan and what she said about Jewish people, I believe. And I, I can't remember what else she did because honestly, to be honest with y'all, I don't follow book drama like I used to. I just, I can't. There's, there's so much negativity going on in the world. There's so much happening that I literally just can't indulge in it. Like I just, I just can't take any more like for fun, you know, no, I protect my peace at all costs. But, you know, I think about her and I think about, you know, how it's affected her and her apology. And I, I don't know if it was sincere because it was like this Instagram apology and she only made it after, you know, people got mad. You know, there's so many things that go into it and I own her series. They're on my shelf and I'm not going to lie. It's made me not want to read them now. So now I'm like, okay, what am I going to do with these books? <laughs> like, am I going to give them away, donate them to the library? I don't want to throw them away. I would never throw away books um, purposefully. <sighs> so much goes into it, y'all. I still don't know. I still don't know. So it's an ongoing conversation. Let me know your thoughts. It's, we're at 57 minutes and 23 seconds. So I'm going to wrap up this very first episode of Late Nights in Bed with Oshi Reads. Or is it in bed late nights? I think, I, I, I don't know. I'm rambling now. But thank you so much for joining me. Um, hopefully we'll be posting this midnight tonight, Monday, April 26th. Okay. Um, yeah, let me know in the comments your thoughts, your feelings. Um. Catch you in my next episode. It's always gonna drop at midnight. I don't know if it's gonna be like Monday nights, Tuesday nights, Wednesday nights. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Y'all know how I am with this consistency thing on YouTube. I'm a very much a creator who creates when they want to create. <laughs> but yes, I am gonna go. Thank you so much for coming. It was a great night. And I will catch you guys in my next episode of Late Nights in Bed with Oshi Reads. Bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs>